welcome to this edition of Berkeley Conversations. I'm Dan Mogula from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs. Today's panel discussion led by UC President Emerita, Janet Napolitano, will focus on American democracy, needed reforms. This is the latest of in a series of online events that enable Berkeley's faculty and friends to share what they know and what they are learning about the salient issues of the day. We want to open this conversation by first acknowledging that the Goldman School of Public Policy and UC Berkeley sit on the territory of Hu Chin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. It is important that we also recognize that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities. And now I'm honored to introduce our esteemed moderator. Having recently joined the faculty at UC Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy, Janet Napolitano previously served as the 20th president of the University of California. Prior to joining the UC, President Napolitano served as Secretary of Homeland Security from 2009 to 2013, was a two-term two governor of Arizona, former Attorney General of Arizona, and a former U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona. President Emerita Napolitano is currently involved in the creation of an exciting new center for the study of security and politics at UC Berkeley and we are grateful to her for assembling today's outstanding panel of speakers. Janet. Thank you, Dan. And uh, I wanna thank Berkeley alum and Goldman School Advisory Board member, Bud Schenken and his good friend, Professor David Levine of UC Hastings Law for helping identify the important and timely topics that we are gonna be discussing today. Whether after a first term or a second term, we will need to evaluate how President Trump has changed the presidency and the country. Trump has exposed the presidency's vulnerability to excesses of authority and weaknesses in accountability. We're here to discuss what a post-Trump presidency could look like and what actions would be needed to better align our institutions of government with democratic norms. With me are Leon Panetta to focus on the executive branch, Song Richardson to focus on our system of justice, and Representative Eric Swalwell to discuss the role of the Congress. Some brief bios. Secretary Leon Panetta served in Congress for 16 years where he chaired the House Budget Committee. In 1993, Secretary Panetta left Congress to serve as Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and then White House Chief of Staff for the Clinton Administration. Returning to public service in the Obama Administration, Secretary Panetta served as Director of the CIA, and then served as Secretary of Defense. Dean Elson Richardson is the second Dean of the Law School at UC Irvine and at the time of her appointment was the only woman of color to lead a top 30 law school. Song is well known as an expert in the science of implicit bias and its influence on legal decisions, perceptions, and judgments. She is also a leading expert on race and policing and has worked with police departments seeking to understand and address the impact of race on their policing practices. Congressman Eric Swalwell was elected in 2012 to represent California's 15th Congressional District, which includes a large part of the East Bay. Now in his fourth term, Congressman Swalwell serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, key leadership positions relevant to today's discussion. We intend today's event to be a lively and interactive discussion. And I invite my fellow panelists to jump in and offer your unique perspectives throughout on how we might rescue and reform American democracy. Representative Swalwell uh, has to leave us at 1230. So we'll start 
uh, with some questions related to the changing role of the Congress. So Eric, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and, and, and let's, let's just begin with how you see the Congress operating today. I mean, to me, it seems uh, almost parliamentary. You're a Democrat or you're a Republican and there's little room for negotiation and compromise. Is that where we are? And if so, why are we there? What can be done about it? Uh, sadly, that, that is where we are, uh, Janet. Thank you and to the Goldman School for convening us and also uh, Secretary uh, Panetta and Professor Richardson. Uh, at our best, uh, we are uh, like uh, former Congressman uh, Panetta, uh, somebody who always worked across the aisle and someone who has mentored me and imparted uh, upon me and, and younger leaders uh, in the Congress now to strive to you know, find partnerships for the good uh, of the country. And uh, frankly, I, I have to say, in my first four years, uh, two thirds of the legislation uh, that I had sponsored and worked on was bipartisan. Uh, but when this president was elected, uh, as you pointed out, the norms were shattered and we were kind of forced into camps. And I, I think you look at today uh, as a great example, uh, post-debate, uh, you see Republican colleagues being asked, uh, do you have a problem that the president called on a white supremacist group to stand back and stand uh, by? And Senator Tim Scott, who I do respect in the Senate said, well, I, I think he misspoke. I hope that's not what he meant to say, but I don't know. And I think that reflects the mindset, which is they want him to be somebody that he's not. And they pretend to themselves that he's somebody that he's not. They want him to be honest when all of the evidence is that he is corrupt. They want him to be decent when all of the evidence is that he's often cruel. And they want him to act like an adult. And as we saw last night, too often he acts like a child. And so uh, if you acknowledge that he is not what you want him to be, I think it's, it's harder for you. You have to look at yourself and what you have enabled. But I say all of this, Janet, because I believe we're on the cusp of a earth shattering election where we are going to win the White House. We're going to pick up six to 10 seats in the Senate. We will keep the House. And I think the best thing that we can do as leaders and the best thing President Biden can do is seek to bring the country together for us to not treat them as we perceive them as treating us for the vice president to put together a blended cabinet, not just you know a token Republican, but have Republicans and Democrats in the cabinet and work immediately on uh, post-Trump reforms uh, that we can all agree on, just as they did after Watergate, uh, that put back in place the norms uh, and customs that this president has taken a wrecking ball to. Uh, and I think this president, uh, or Vice President Biden, uh, his instinct has always been to reach across the aisle, and we're going to need a leader like that uh, in this post-Trump era. Yeah, so, and maybe Leon wants to jump in here too. So uh, what are the um, kinds of um, uh, norms uh, or traditions that you think uh, we would like uh, you would like us to return to. You want me to take a shot at that? <laughs> sure, Leon. Why don't you take a shot, and then we'll go to Eric. Uh, as uh, as Eric knows, I often say that I've uh, seen Washington at its best and Washington at its worst. Uh, the good news is I've seen Washington work. Uh, when I first went back to uh, to the Senate as a legislative assistant to Tom Keekle, who was a Republican minority leader, uh, that there were a number of, uh, of moderate members, uh, Republicans, who worked with uh, Democrats. Uh, yes, they had their political differences, but they worked together on major legislation, uh, and uh, and were, were able to pass civil rights laws, were able to pass environmental laws, education laws. Uh, that were important to the country. And when I, when I was elected uh, to Congress, uh, Tip O'Neill was the speaker, uh, Democrats, Democrat, uh, but he had a great friendship with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader. And uh, again, they had their political differences, but on the big issues, they worked together, whether it was a, a Republican president or a Democratic president, they worked together on big issues. I mean, during the Reagan administration, uh, we passed immigration reform, we passed social security reform, we passed budgets, we passed uh, uh, tax reform, major tax reform bill, uh, all because people wanted to work together. And obviously, as Eric's pointed out, uh, it's very difficult now for 
for people to, to be able to have the trust necessary in order to uh, be able to talk, to, to dialogue with one another and to compromise. Because in the end, that's the process you need. Uh, and, and when I was there, governing was good politics. I'm not so sure that governing is good politics today. Uh, rather, it's confronting the other side, stopping the other side, doing whatever's necessary to kind of uh, fulfill a particular party goal. Uh, and so somehow it, it is absolutely essential uh, to get back to a situation where, and I, and I think Eric's right. I mean, Joe Biden is by nature a legislator. That's what he did for almost 40 years uh, working on legislation. And he was somebody you, who you could trust. It was somebody who was willing to work with one another. I, I, I'm sure he's going to try to do that. Now, I think the question is whether or not a Mitch McConnell, uh, if Mitch McConnell heads a minority in the Senate, whether he's going to be willing to engage uh, with the president or whether he's going to do as he did with Barack Obama, basically say, my goal is to basically bring this president down. And then if, you know, if Joe Biden tries to test that water and it goes nowhere, then it is going to be back to being a partisan operated operation because there's no other alternative. And that's not good for the country. But I think it's also what, what we're going to be going through because of what's happened these last four years. Eric? And, and Janet, we introduced last week, uh, Chairman Schiff uh, wrote what's called the Protect Our Democracy Act. Uh, and it's sweeping uh, Watergate, post-Watergate-like uh, reforms. Uh, it creates uh, you know, a, a fast track to the courts if you're in a constitutional crisis. As we saw in impeachment, uh, one of the challenges was that if the president just says, I'm not gonna cooperate with subpoenas or I'm gonna prevent people from coming forward, you have to wait in the courts. And we'd still be waiting in the courts for John Bolton, for example, uh, because we're waiting on Don McGahn uh, that case has not yet reached the Supreme Court. Uh, it also extends the statute of limitations for when a president uh, could be indicted if the Department of Justice policy says uh, that you cannot be indicted. It creates a criminal penalty uh, for uh, any president that would receive a gift from a foreign leader. Of course, we have the emoluments clause in the Constitution, but there's no remedy for it. At best, a court could issue an injunction and stop the emolument, uh, but we would create a criminal penalty uh, for that. We also uh, have a duty to report that if you uh, as a candidate uh, or a family member of a candidate or a campaign aide of a candidate uh, receive information from an agent of a foreign power, you have to tell uh, law enforcement. Of course, that was uh, what we confronted in 2016, although the Trump campaign had received information from uh, agents of foreign powers, they did not tell law enforcement. And in the Mueller report, you saw that uh, while uh, they laid out the contacts with Russia, the expectation that they would benefit from Russia. No prior Congress had conceived that any campaign would do this, so there were no criminal laws that uh, were broken. Uh, also, when it comes to uh, being able to hold uh, folks in contempt, uh, again, if they're not, if the executive branch is going to stymie Congress, uh, you rely on you know the what's called uh, an accommodations process where you negotiate back and forth over uh, what can be sent over. But if that breaks down. Uh, then you rely on a court enforcing a subpoena. But if the president is going to take every case to the Supreme Court, as he's doing right now, uh, Congress needs to have its own inherent contempt power. Uh, so separately, there's also an effort in Congress uh, to have a fine process where people would be fined uh, if they just refuse to come forward. Again, I see it as taking what we all know is the honor code, uh, the rules, the, nor the norms, the customs, the traditions that are not codified. They're not in the rule of law but good men and women have always followed them. And now we have a president who is testing us and challenging us because he's not following them. So we need to move them from the honor code to the rule of law. I hope it gets Republican support, especially if it's a Democratic president, because uh, if a Democratic president you know, was not uh, following any of those norms and customs, you'd wanna make sure you had a way to hold that person accountable. And so maybe that's what it will take. Uh, but I do think for the good of the nation uh, to make sure this never happens again, 
uh, that's what we're going to have to do. And, and Janet, my promise to you, uh, you'll hear probably the buzzing in the background and the secretary is familiar with the sound. Uh, we're voting, but I'm gonna go black uh, just for about 10 minutes and I'm gonna come back and, and I'll stay on. Uh, but we're in the midst of voting on a uh, condemning China for the treatment uh, of the Uyghur population uh, right now. So we're, uh, we have that resolution, bipartisan resolution on the floor. So I'm gonna go vote on that and I'll be uh, right back. And I look forward to hearing from Professor Richardson. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Yep. Um, uh, Leon, um, uh, why don't we uh, uh, take advantage of your vast experience and uh, maybe uh, uh, you could, um, uh, from your vantage point, uh, discuss you know some of the major changes that you have seen in the Trump administration in terms of. Uh, how the presidency is operating. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank you, Janet, for uh, asking me to participate and also the Goldman uh, School uh, for uh, putting this together. I, I, I think these kinds of programs are extremely important, particularly today uh, when we all are concerned about uh, our democracy and our system of checks and balances. So thank you for doing this. Uh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, if anybody <laughs> watched the debate last night, uh, the president is a walking violation of uh, every, every rule of presidential behavior. Uh, and you saw it last night. Uh, and we've seen it since the beginning of uh, his term in the, as president of the United States. I mean, uh, my biggest concerns were this president as commander in chief basically violating some of the important, uh, important rules that uh, guide a commander in chief. I mean, for example, uh, to have a commander in chief, I think it was on his almost his first day in office, uh, go to uh, the CIA uh, and uh, you've been there, Janet. Uh, uh, downstairs in the CIA, there's a wall that the has wall of heroes. Yeah, uh, a uh, all of those the stars on the wall represent all of those who've given their life uh, on behalf of this country. Uh, a lot of them unnamed, uh, and that's kind of uh, you know sacred territory. Uh, and uh, I remember when uh, President Obama went to speak there. Uh, how he went out of his way to pay tribute to the people that had done that and uh, recognized uh, the importance of, uh, of that location. And here, Trump goes there and gives a blatantly political speech talking about the, the crowd sizes uh, and uh, was speaking to a group of professionals uh, who are not political. Uh, as you know, these are not Republicans or Democrats. They really are people who are trying to do uh, the service of the country. And then to have a president as commander in chief who doesn't pay attention to the intelligence that's provided to the commander in chief. My God, uh, the whole point of intelligence is to provide information to the uh, political leaders so they can protect the security of this country. And here's a president who doesn't accept intelligence if it goes against his own view of uh, what's happening. It doesn't even take the time to read the PDB, the presidential daily brief. Uh, which, uh, you know, as you've done and I've done, it's, it's, uh, it's a document that uh, presents all the threats to this country around the world. He doesn't want to read it, doesn't want to pay attention to it. Well, uh, and, and, and what's, um, you know, what people need to understand is the president's daily brief is a discipline. Uh, you, you need to read it every day so that you begin to see trends and uh, things developing over time. It's it's not just a one-page pictograph. It's it's a it's an ongoing analysis, and um, yeah, it does it does trouble me greatly that President Trump doesn't take advantage of that. You can imagine. I mean, I, especially when I mean the intelligence came forward and said that uh, the Russians uh, had been offering bounties on the heads of our men and women in uniform, uh, and the president, for you know, first of all, said he didn't read it or didn't he wasn't aware of it. Of course, it's in the PDB. Uh, which is something you should be reading. Uh, but then when he was aware of it, did nothing to, uh, to go to the Russians and tell them to, to stop uh, any behavior that would uh, put bounties on the heads of our men and women in uniform. 
Uh, so that concerns me. And then as commander in chief, uh, using the military for political purposes, violating kind of the civilian military relationship, uh, what he did in Lafayette Park uh, is a disgrace because uh, he was trying to politicize the military. And, you know, thank God, uh, even though I think the military leaders made a mistake by going out there, uh, they came back and said they would never do it again. So they, they understand that. But it, but it undermines uh, that relationship that's critical. It undermines, uh, he also undermined the discipline, you know, that you have in the military. He's been basically, you know, pe if people do something that he doesn't mind, uh, he's been interfering with the disciplinary process in the military. Not to mention the fact that he then goes, uh, you know, to Normandy and basically says that, uh, that the people who fought and died for this country are nothing but suckers and losers. Imagine a president of the United States saying that about people who died for this country. So you start there and then go to uh, his willingness to bypass the Congress in order to get money for the wall. He's using defense money uh, that was not intended for the wall, but intended for military bases and for our, for our soldiers. He's using that money to build this crazy wall. Uh, he's issued executive orders on immigration uh, that basically shut down immigration from countries without any kind of basis in fact uh, for doing that. Uh, he's on trade, he implements tariffs as if he's the guy who's totally in charge of putting tariffs on people without going through any process, without going through any of the trade organizations. Uh, he's obviously tried to obstruct justice. So what he did with uh, the FBI director Comey and trying to get him to not investigate uh, Mike Flynn, uh, what he did with the Ukraine and getting them to try to investigate uh, Joe Biden, uh, even though that went to an impeachment. Uh, the problem was that here's a president who who doesn't, doesn't understand that you do not ask Russia, you do not ask China, you do not ask the Ukraine, you do not ask foreign governments to get involved in our politics. You just don't. And yet, you know, he goes ahead and does that. So, I, I mean, almost in every area you look at, you have a president who who does not understand or, or refuses to accept uh, the standards and the boundaries and the values that we have always associated with the role of president of the United States. And that, that is a frightening prospect because there is a lot of power associated with the presidency. And to have somebody who is willing to violate uh, that past history. I mean, I, I've served under nine presidents there isn't one president that I've served under who did not in the very least respect the values of the office of the presidency. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that um, uh, has troubled me is uh, we have a president who is, as you say, um, violating the norms of the office, um, uh, um, but a, a a, a Congress that has stood by and let that happen. Uh, and uh, uh, in a way, acceded a lot of its power and authority uh, to, to the president. Um, and and I'm, uh, is, is this something that we should just conclude is, you know, just a, a, a feature of having President Trump and a Republican majority and it's gonna, it's just gonna, go back to normal over time, or uh, do we need to be thinking of uh, more uh, statutory action by the Congress to tighten up uh, uh, about what the executive can do uh, uh, on his own and what he can't? No, we, we've, uh, I think we've had over, frankly, the last 20 years or more, uh, a slow erosion of uh, our system of checks and balances. Uh, look, our, our forefathers uh, understood uh, uh, the challenges here. They, di they didn't want a king. They didn't want a king parliament. They didn't want a star chamber court. Uh, they did not want power to reside in any one branch of government. Uh, and that's why they developed the system of checks and balances to try to make sure that that would never happen. Uh, and we've had a slow erosion of that 
approach over these last number of years. I mean, Congress has ceded more and more authority uh, to presidents uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, presidents, uh, you know, as we know, can basically uh, send our forces into war uh, without having to go to the Congress. Uh, and that's, that's been a growing trend of reflecting greater power on the part of the executive. And the Congress uh, obviously has refused to act to uh, check the president. And, you know, it is, it's very disappointing when Republicans, uh, you know, many of whom I've worked with and respect uh, will not stand up uh, and say when this president uh, is, uh, is behaving in the way he does and, and, and doing things that, that violate uh, the laws, uh, that they will not stand up uh, and say it's wrong. I mean, I, you know, that, that's a scary prospect to have members of the Congress who are in leadership positions uh, not be willing to say this is wrong. I mean, when he, when he said, when the president said that he would not accept uh, a peaceful uh, transition of power uh, to a new president. I mean, my God, this is the president of the United States saying he will not accept our constitutional process uh, where uh, the American people express in a free and fair way their vote for president. He won't accept it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Republicans did say, no, 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 we're, we're, we'll abide by the Constitution, rather than saying to the president of the United States, this is unacceptable. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> I, I have to jump in to, to say that too, because the complicity of our senators, right, of our Republican colleagues is disgusting. Um, and I and speak up, otherwise you're complicit. And to continue to hear our senators and Congress people apologize for a president when he has made it very clear over and over and over again that he does not respect the institutions of our democracy. So how much longer will our Republican congressmen and senators remain silent? That's what I, I that's the part that I just don't understand. I mean, what someone once said, when someone shows you who they are over and over and over again, believe them. And, and I wish that they would think about the future generations if they don't care about what is going on right now, think about the future and how it will look back on their complicity, on their silence, on their apologies for a president who appears to believe that he is still on a reality show. I mean, that is what I, I mean, and it is reality. That, that's what's sad, right? But, but he's acting like he's still on The Apprentice, right? Like he doesn't realize this. And then what about his family members? Like, I, I'm curious about that too. Right, his family that he's put into positions of power, they are remaining silent. I mean, we cannot remain silent anymore. Um, yeah. And I just. Well, that's. Uh, yeah, so I'm, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, uh, you know, normally uh, the presidents that I work with uh, understand that you, you really have to have the very best advisors around you. Mm -hmm who are experienced, uh, who are, are knowledgeable about uh, what's right and wrong, uh, who know their issues and want to hear from those advisors, want to hear from those secretaries in the cabinet uh, as to what they should or should not do. That I mean, most presidents know that they have limited knowledge in a lot of areas. <laughs> and they, can't, they can't know everything or no. be experts in everything. <laughs> That's right. He's the smartest guy on everything. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the understand that there are areas uh, that are complex and that uh, have to, you have to have people who are knowledgeable. And, and add to that the role of a, of a chief of staff. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've had the honor to serve in that position. And if, if you're a chief of staff, one of your responsibilities is to walk into the Oval Office and say, Mr. President, you cannot do this. This is wrong. And you know, look, I've, I've, I've done that with presidents. They don't like it. And sometimes they get angry. But the fact is that they, deep down, they know. Mm -hmm. They know that they've got to put the brakes on. Uh, 
And I talked to John Kelly, who, who used to work for me as a military aide when I was uh, secretary. And John Kelly thought he could do the same thing with Trump. And Kelly was, sh was shut down. He was shut down. And so if you don't have a chief of staff, if you have no checks in the system to basically say to the president, whether it's a family member, whether it's a staff person, whether it's a cabinet member, to say, Mr. President, you cannot do this. You cannot do this. I mean, the Secretary of Defense should have said to the President of the United States, you cannot use the military to go into Lafayette Park. Mm -hmm. So I, Secretary, I, I, I could not agree more. And, and as someone who studies leadership, as everyone on this, on, on this meeting has, right? We, we know we study leadership and exactly what you say is what great leaders do. They surround themselves with people who are smarter than them. And though they might not like what they're hearing, they know they need to hear it. And, and, and with our current president, I, he is so insecure that he cannot listen to anyone. And what shocks me to go back to the earlier point then is what are people so afraid of? Why can you not just stand up to him, whoever you might, maybe his kids are too afraid of him. Maybe that's the case. But senators and congressmen and other people like stand up to a bully well, who is know, insecure. Uh, you know, I see uh, Eric's back and, and, and maybe he'll chip in. But one of the things no. I, I think uh, we need to appreciate is politically how uh, um, elections, at, at least in the Congress and in the, and in the Senate too, I guess, is, it's the primary is the real election. And that seems to draw people to the edges of their party, not to uh, the middle. And uh, I think there is a, a real fear uh, right now in the Republican party that if they speak up and speak out, uh, they will be uh, the subject of a tweet and and then the subject potentially of a primary. Um, I don't yeah, know. I, I have a, a real life in. example to speak to Song's uh, question. The secretary uh, helped me in the days after uh, the 2016 election when we were just learning on the intelligence committee what Russia had done uh, in the election and. I wanted to have us undertake uh, a September 11 commission-like uh, you know, task uh, to look at what Russia had done and, and seeing that you know, is, is the antidote to future attacks is uniting uh, the country to say, we're not gonna let this happen again. And the secretary helped me and advised me on uh, writing uh, the legislation and, and he signed on to a, a statement, a bipartisan statement of former uh, officials in national security from the Bush, uh, Clinton, uh, and Obama administration. And I sought to find Republicans uh, to join me, uh, to have a, a commission, a bipartisan independent commission outside of Congress uh, to look at this. And every Democrat in the House signed on, and that is easier said than done. It's, it's not easy to get all of your colleagues to sign on to a piece of legislation, but I only got two Republicans. And a lot of my Republican friends, I would work them uh, you know, on the floor or in the intelligence committee. And they would say to me, Look, when this one woman on the committee said, when he tweets, he wins. And I've already had my head lopped off for not supporting him in the primary. Another person, um, Mark Sanford, uh, someone I worked very well with uh, from South Carolina, former governor of South Carolina, uh, congressional member from South Carolina. He kept telling me, we'll keep sending you more information about the bill. This is something I'll consider. And he had spoken out against the president just a little bit, just put his neck out just a millimeter. And Trump started tweeting at him. And when the primary came up in South Carolina, uh, Trump went all in against Sanford, an incumbent, and Sanford lost. And the week after Sanford lost, the Republicans had their conference meeting, their weekly conference meeting, and Trump came and visited. And Sanford was present. And Trump danced on his political grave in front of the whole conference, uh, pointing out that Sanford had lost. And he wasn't doing that you know, only to embarrass Sanford. He was doing that to send a message to the other members that if you cross me, uh, there'll be a price. I think the answer to that, two good government reforms that we have in California that I would like to see nationwide, independent redistricting, uh, so that lines are drawn not to protect Democrats or Republicans, but just to follow geography and communities of interest, 
and to have a top two primary. We have a top two primary in California. I ran against a 40 year incumbent in my own party because any voter from any party could vote uh, for any candidate uh, in the primary. And that I think would inoculate us against uh, some of the challenges we have right now uh, where, uh, the pri where, where your fear of being primaried uh, drives you to make decisions you know, against the interests of the country. Yeah, look, the, uh, the problem is that you know, we're dealing with a very polarized country. Uh, it's obvious to all of us. Uh, and, uh, and that polarization is reflected uh, in the Congress. Uh, and if you're going to govern, if you're going to be able to uh, find consensus, uh, you've got to be able to work, you know, usually either uh, left to center or right to center, but you've got to be able to work in that area in order to be able to find solutions. Uh, and the problem, the problem today is that uh, the parties are basically locked in trench warfare where nobody wants to walk into no man's land <laughs> to try to you know resolve issues because they may get shot in the back uh and you know somehow we have got to get back to a situation where uh, governing is okay <laughs> governing is okay i mean that's why we elect you guys that's why we elected me was to go back and govern mm -hmm. and, and solve issues and and look you know right now in the congress uh you know, I hope they do come to some consensus on uh, aid for the COVID-19. My God, we certainly need it uh, for the sake of the country. Uh, but they, you know, they, they, can't, they can't resolve immigration reform. They can't resolve health care reform. They can't resolve uh, infrastructure funding, which is something everybody supposedly supports. Uh, I mean, I, I, don't need, I, I hesitate to even mention this, but there is something called the debt uh, and, and budgets that nobody's paying attention to. Uh, that is, that's a time bomb in terms of the future uh, and what it's doing for our kids in the future. Uh, and so there are these issues that democracy is supposed to deal with. And, and I, I tell the students here at, at the Institute, you know, that we govern either by leadership or by crisis. I mean, that's the bottom line. And if there's leadership that's willing to take the risk associated with leadership and make no mistake about it, it involves risk. If you're going to if you're going to try to find consensus, if you're going to do compromise, you know, you're going to wind up offending people in your own party. Yep. But that's governing. And if people are willing to exercise that leadership, then we will govern. If not, crisis will basically run this country. Uh, and that's largely what we have today is crisis is running the country. And chaos from this president is the rule of the day. I mean, last night was a perfect reflection of that. Here's a president who, you know, is unwilling to stand up and debate issues, real issues, debate his own record as president. I mean, my God, this guy's been president for four years. And he can't stand there with, with respect and with substance, speak to his positions. He's got to be a bully. He's got to operate by chaos. And so everybody kind of now follows that example. You know, it's better to be to have chaos. It's better to have crisis than to try to resolve issues and govern the country. I mean, it, this is without question, I think the most important election in recent history, because it will tell us whether or not we're going to have a country in decline or whether we're going to be able to uh, to, to give a rebirth to our democracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that um, uh, has emerged um, in the public's view over, over the summer with the murder of George Floyd and, and uh, the Breonna Taylor and uh, Aubrey in Georgia and so forth is uh, mm -hmm. the whole issue of racism. And we saw that last night in the debate uh, where uh, the president was asked point blank, uh, you know, um, will you, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, criticize white nationalists? And he he ducked. He wouldn't. He wouldn't do. It. He couldn't do it uh, for whatever reason. Um, uh, 
but uh, this is another uh, uh, light motif that I think underlies this uh, election and, and how our country is going to um, deal with issues of uh, of race and and uh, I'm gonna uh, ask Song um, uh, some of your thoughts on that and what you think uh, a, a first of all what you think the risk is in this election uh, with uh, in respect to the uh, issues of race and then also what what we can do to move forward. Oh, every single topic is depressing. Um, so first though, Janet, I wanna thank you for, for inviting me here and the Goldman School for having me here. It's, it's great to be with all of you to have this important conversation. And it's all I can do throughout so far, not to interrupt because I don't wanna be like uh, the president in the debate yesterday. So, uh, okay, but, but, but to get to the very serious uh, question, I have to say that when after George Floyd's death, immediately after that, when we were seeing all of the statements that were coming out, you know, there, there weren't, um, I, I, I can't imagine an organization that did not say something. I was unhappy, actually. <laughs> One might imagine that I'd be so thrilled, right, that everyone is paying attention to it. And instead, I, I, I was disgusted, actually, to be completely frank. Um, and the reason I was is, this is not the first time, right? The, the reckoning with race that we're seeing across the country has been going on for centuries. So the fact that people were jumping on the bandwagon um, all of a sudden because it was the, I, I don't know, the, it was important to do, but I didn't take it seriously. I don't feel that way now um, because so much is happening. People are getting far more comfortable with being uncomfortable with having these incredibly deep conversations about race, structural racism, implicit bias, the changes that are needed. So I feel a sense of hope and what I'm about to say is gonna seem counterintuitive, I think. The fact that the president and the office of management and budget, and now we have another statement coming out, the fact that they felt the need to try to hide our history to say that talking about white supremacy and structural racism, I'm surprised they didn't go as far as to say we shouldn't talk about slavery either. But the fact that they felt the need to say it, to say that, says to me that change is happening because you don't need to go that far. You don't need to go to that ridiculous level to try to hide the history of race in our country if you don't think that change is happening. So I took it as a positive sign, even though what he said and, and what the government is saying is terrible. So what are a, a couple of things, I, I'll, I'll stop, but I just wanna mention, um, first of all, we have to get better, both as a country individually, but also Congress has to think about the type of statutes we want, not the colorblind statutes, not the ones that say uh, we, we have to act intentionally with regard to race before we can do anything about it. That is not how, well, racism is working like that now because of the president that we have. People are feeling free to express their racism. But the big problem with regard to race that we have in our country is even without conscious racists, the systems that we have in place will continue to operate in ways that are inequitable. So if we want to deal, truly deal with the racial problems that have existed in our country since the beginning, then we need to be brave enough to start to dismantle the structures that exist within our laws, within our systems, in order to get true equity. So th there are lots of things we could do in that space, but that is the broad message, right? We just need to look at everything that and how we've been doing everything and question it. And when we do, it will be difficult. We will all have to make sacrifices, but I think we are on that road because the president and the office of management and budget have now said that we can't do trainings, right? That raise issues like critical race theory and, and things like that. So. That, that's my long answer to your, your, your question, Janet. Eric, do you think this is something Congress can deal with? 
Yes, uh, but we're not the only ones who have to deal with it. Uh, and I'm encouraged that, uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, in the boardroom, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, they, boardrooms are being forced to confront, you know, what their boardrooms look like, you know, as far as having uh, people of color and, and women uh, at the table. And as consumers, we should continue to demand, you know, and expect that. Of course, the voters in California, uh, Propos Proposition 16 is on the ballot, uh, which I'm supporting. In the Congress, uh, we, have, we have passed in the House the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which makes uh, reforms from banning the chokehold uh, to reducing the standard uh, that you need to prove a civil rights case of, against a police officer to having a national uh, misconduct board for police officers and requiring body cameras. Now, I'm the son of a cop. My brothers are police officers right now. I was a prosecutor. I worked with uh, Secretary Panetta's son. Uh, as a prosecutor in Alameda County. And I saw in, in my work and with my brothers and my father, the best of policing. Uh, one of my brothers is a uh, the deputy sheriff athletic league uh, coordinator. Uh, so in addition to working as a police officer, uh, he leads a boxing gym and a, a soccer league. And I see that when you invest that way uh, in neighborhoods that don't always have you know investments like that, uh, that that can you know help people rather than have them see police only as showing up uh, you know, when there's a conflict or seeing police as presuming that you're dangerous or guilty because of the color uh, of your skin. And so I would rather see us continue to make investments uh, like that, uh, make sure that uh, our police officers also understand uh, that there is this perception that African Americans in our country are, as I said, dangerous uh, and guilty, and that we have to overcome, you know, that implicit, uh, you know, view that many have uh, of them. And one example, Secretary, after George Floyd's death, death, I went to a church in my district and had a uh, community, uh, you know, a distanced community town hall with African-American leaders and listened to, uh, you know, people in the community talk and, and raise concerns about, you know, being targeted. And then later that evening, I went to a police lineup because there were protests happening in Oakland. And I, I went to the police lineup uh, to, wish that the officers uh, are safe and, you know, that they also are able to work with the protesters uh, who are marching peacefully. And I told the officers at that lineup, I said, I want you to know I met this morning with people in our community about race relations with the police. And one person shared with me that he feels safe only twice a day. Uh, that's when he wakes up in his own home that he worked hard to pay for. And when he walks through his door at the end of his job, in between those two points, he said he drives a nice car that he worked hard to pay for, but people in his neighborhood look at him like he's a drug dealer or maybe he stole a car. He said he sees police officers often pull up behind him to run his plates and then they drive off because he doesn't have any warrants. And these officers, it was tracking with them as I was telling them the story, but I told them what you need to know about this person is he is a captain in your department. <laughs> and if he feels that way, as a captain in law enforcement, imagine how people feel who are not in law enforcement. And so I think many of our officers have to look no farther than their own you know, African-American colleagues to understand what the experience is like and how we can uh, change that. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I'd like to see happen is uh, for more people of color to be in law enforcement and to be in prosecutors' offices. Um, uh, and, and Song, I, I don't uh, know how you think about this, but I, I've uh, spoken to many groups of law students um, uh, uh, and the you know, Latino law students, the black law students, and uh, I routinely ask them how many of them uh, um, wanna go into the criminal justice system and, and a lot raise their hands and I, and I say, and uh, of, of those of you who do, how many of you want to be on the prosecution side or the defense side? And almost uniformly, they want to be on the defense side. Um, and we really need, uh, we really need them on the prosecution side because that's where so many of the key decisions are made um, in terms of charging, plea bargaining and, and, and all the rest. Um, yes. uh, so I don't know what your experience is in, in that arena, but I'd yes, be I would hear. Um, so Janet, I couldn't agree with you more about the importance of diversity within law enforcement, um, within the police departments, within 
uh, prosecutor's offices. I, I think it's critically important. I myself was a public defender uh, and a criminal defense lawyer, both a state and a federal public defense lawyer. And so I would definitely uh, encourage my students to go that route. It is very important to do that. But, uh, but, but I also think it's important and I also encourage them if they wanna go and work as a, as a prosecutor or a police officer. But here's the, the, the caution that I have, which is, and, and it's what I say to my students. You can be the best person ever, right? Like to have the same heart as a public defender might, but choose the right office. Because once you are in that office, the way you work your way up in that office matters, right? We're all competitive people. We all wanna be successful. It's why actually I didn't become a prosecutor. I could imagine a world in which all I wanna do is win. Prosecutors have a greater duty, right? They're supposed to be ministers of justice, but we can't help but also be competitive. And if you are in an office that basically counts how often you win a case and they don't care how you do it, or if you are in an office where the police department, um, when you know that there are bad officers, there are police officers who I work with, they want to get eliminate those bad officers as much as we do. And yet it is so difficult to do that. So as a young prosecutor, are you really going to go one-on-one -on -one against that bad officer? Of course not, unless you have the support of your office, because otherwise you won't get cooperation from that police department in any of the other important cases that you have. So I think this is a perfect example of, we need good people to be it, prosecutors. We definitely do. And we need them uh, all the way to the I just what a great point. Um, yep. in the, the bells are ringing again, so I'm going to have to. Oh, no. <laughs> I, Song, to your point, uh, I want to just tell you the experience I had. And I, I think this is a, a good example of when an office gets it right. Mm -hmm. During my interview to be a law clerk in the district attorney's office, uh, the current DA, Nancy O'Malley, gave me a hypothetical. It was the last question she asked me during the interview. She said, OK, um, please pull over somebody. You have, you have the case for a motion to suppress the evidence. Uh, and um, basically it's a, a car stop, officer finds you know, pounds of heroin and you know, guns in the trunk. And right before he goes to testify, he whispers to you, by the way, you know, the guy really did not run the stop sign. I just, I know he's a bad guy and we had a good tip. So I, you know, I wanted to pull him over. She said, what do you do? And again, as a law student, I want to get the job, right? And you also, as you said, you want to win. Yes. And I, you know, it, was, it took me a couple seconds to collect my thoughts. And I, I said to Nancy, I said, well, I would dismiss the case and tell the officer, we'll get him next time. And she did not reveal to me whether that was the right or wrong answer. She just said, okay, thank you. We'll, we'll follow up with you. So for weeks, I thought I had failed the test because I said, let the drug dealer with guns go. <laughs> And at the first happy hour for the law clerks in the summer, I asked her, I said, so like, what kind of answers do you get? And she said, you wouldn't believe the number of people who say, well, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. You know, you know, we, we got a bad guy off the street. And then she looked at me and said, but you'll never meet those people because we don't hire them. And that experience as a law clerk is why I wanted to stay in the office. Yes. Uh, so I think you're right. Find offices where it's not about wins and losses. It's about uh, doing uh, justice. So Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to go vote. Uh, thank you again. It's such a privilege, I, and especially uh, Janet. Thanks for stitching this together. Whenever Secretary Panetta speaks, uh, I listen. He inspires me. A song, nice to meet you. And I want to give a shout out to one of my former aides, Scott Miller, who is now uh, at uh, Berkeley and uh, watching this uh, today, who's doing good work himself in public service. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Eric. Um, and I, could I, she, and, yeah, could I just uh, comment on, on uh, you know, on, on some of the things related to this very difficult issue? Um, I mean, obviously, uh, leadership is critical uh, at every level uh, that understands the nature of this problem and is willing to be strong and, and provide leadership. Education is absolutely critical to be able to give young people a sense of, of the history and a sense of what's right and wrong uh, with regards to these relationships. Uh, the ability to provide opportunity 
uh, to young people, you know, as the, as the son of Italian immigrants, getting, getting a good education, but then, you know, being able to get uh, a chance at the American dream was, was incredibly important. And that's what we've got to provide, uh, a chance at, at the American dream that, you know, you're going to be judged based on uh, the quality of, of your work, not, not on what your racial color is or your creed or anything else, but on the quality of your work. Uh, those are all incredibly important. Uh, and also, frankly, to, you know, to not just pass laws, but to enforce those laws. Uh, and I say that as somebody who was director of the Office for Civil Rights uh, at uh, the old HEW and, and responsible for enforcing civil rights laws. Uh, this was in the South when uh, black children and white children were separated by law. Uh, and to be able to go there. And, and I, I had the power essentially to withhold federal funds if they did not break up the, the segregation in those districts. And that was tough. There was a lot of political opposition to that. Uh, but we, we enforced the law. And that was important to give kids that opportunity to be able to get an, an equal and decent education. Uh, but let me tell you something. The thing I worry about the most right now is what can happen on election day with what the president said uh, last night. Yep. Because he, he basically sent a signal out yep. to uh, the right wing extremists uh, that they should stand by, you know, and if he is uh, defeated in this election and refuses to accept the results of that, uh, I really do worry about uh, what he will do uh, in terms of these groups and trying to somehow mobilize those groups uh, to, uh, to provide the chaos yep. to try to undermine what happens in the election. And the rest, rest of us stand by mm -hmm. uh, and try to follow the law and try to wait for the ballots while he's using these groups to disrupt our society. That is a very dangerous moment. Yeah. I'm not sure that we're ready to deal with that. that that's what concerns me. That, you know, I, we haven't really mobilized yeah. uh, an effort to try to stop that from happening. And, and I don't, there's no question in my mind that that's exactly what this president is going to do. He is scared to death of losing this election, and he will resort to anything in order to maintain his position. That's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Song, you wanted to chip in here? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I could not agree more with you, which is why I can't remember if we had started this yet or not today. When we were talking about, I think the scariest time is after the election, right? During that period of uncertainty. And I have the identical fear that you have. And I don't think it's a fear. I think it's a reality. And that's the part that scares me because I don't know how we respond to exactly what he is planning. I mean, he said it in the debate yesterday, right? Like it, it's not a secret, which gets back to the point I think you were making secretary or you, Janet, at the beginning of people who say, oh, he's just saying that, right? He doesn't really mean it. No, he really means it. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we know that. And so I don't know. I, I, Personally, I've been stockpiling everything again, right? Like we did at the beginning of COVID because I don't know what our world, what our country will look like. Um, so I just yeah. wanted to jump in to, to, to agree with you completely. And I haven't lived through anything like this in, in my life. And, and I hope really that it is a time that our country, not the ones on the fringes, but that us, like those of us who care, regardless of where we are in the political spectrum, those of us who believe in our democracy will finally have the courage to stand up. You know, I think, I think the, the hope that, you know, and I'm working with a, a group of fellow members, uh, former military, uh, to try to make sure that uh, obviously we do have uh, an election process that, uh, that works for our country. But uh, I, I think the best scenario is that Joe Biden wins by a landslide. Yes. Yeah. So and there's no question at all. Exactly. 
exactly. If he wins by a landslide, uh, even though it may take a while to count all the vote, votes, but it clearly looks that way, then I I do believe that uh, that at some point <laughs> the Republican leadership is going to have to stand up and say it is what it is, Mr. President. <laughs> it is what it is. You've lost, uh, and it's time to go. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know that would be the best scenario. Uh, but if it, you know, if it's if it's questionable and if it's doubtful and if the president thinks he can somehow uh, stick it out, uh, th that becomes the worst scenario. Yeah. And you know, I'm look, I'm convinced that the military leadership will not allow him to uh, uh, to use them to breach the Constitution. I really believe that. But as you know, um, and, and you know, Song's a uh, you know, head of a law school. Uh, she knows that uh, there are legal ways to drag this thing out uh, that can go on for uh, you know for months here. Uh, and if it goes to the House of Representatives, that's a whole you know other ball game. And that, so there are scenarios that don't play out very well. Uh, that uh, could make it really difficult. Uh, so I, I really think this is a moment, you know, not just to kind of beat our breasts, but to really kind of mobilize people to be prepared to fight this in the courts, uh, to, be, to be prepared to uh, help our election system do what it's supposed to do, uh, and to really make sure that we protect our democracy. Uh, I, I, this. This is that moment in time. I think it was uh, Friedman today in the New York Times said, this is the scariest moment uh, that we've had in our country's history. Uh, and, and he said, you know, Civil War was bad. Uh, obviously the World Wars were bad. Pearl Harbor was bad. 9-11 was bad. This is a bad time. Yeah. We have got to be aware of the need for all of us to respond to protecting our democracy. Yeah, we need to be leaning forward and leaning into it. Um, uh, we need to uh, make sure that people can vote and that all their votes are counted uh, and that uh, the count is, is not prematurely terminated in any state. Um, I think there'll be an effort to do that. Uh, and uh, I think there'll be a, a, an effort to throw out lots of ballots and many of those ballots that are discarded will be ballots from people of color. Um, uh, I, you know, I think um, uh, the notion of, uh, and this was hinted at last night, uh, ending up in the Supreme Court, and Trump is already saying, to end up in the Supreme Court, which now looks like we'll have three justices that um, he put on the bench and, uh, uh, a, a six three solid conservative uh, majority. He he pretty much is assuming the court's going to do whatever he asks. Um, this could be a test for the court. Uh, are they institutionally truly independent? Um, and if, as you know, if it goes to the House of Representatives, each delegation gets uh, one vote. Uh, and if your delegation is the majority uh, Republican, uh, uh, you get the same vote as um, uh, if, uh, if you, you're from a much larger state and it's a majority Democratic uh, uh, state. Uh, so, you know, from, a, from a, a legal process standpoint, there are lots of risks here. And the longer it is um, strung out, I think, the greater the potential for civil unrest uh, and very serious civil unrest. Um, and, and then uh, are we uh, prepared or how are we going to deal with that? Uh, uh, and and uh, more importantly, what is the current occupant of the White House going to be doing and saying during this period? Um, is he gonna continue to inflame people? Uh, or is he going to say, everybody, calm down, we're going to count the votes, I will abide by the people's um, wishes. Uh, somehow I don't think that is going to be what uh, the attitude he takes. 
I think you're right, especially yeah. after, especially after seeing uh, his tax uh, his, his <laughs> reports, which you know indicate that uh, he may very well be subject to prosecution. Uh, yeah, he, he has <laughs> he, he, he has a direct need to stay in office and away from <laughs> uh, and away from the prosecutors. Um, <laughs> But it does raise the, the issue of the role of the courts, um, and uh, uh, particularly uh, the role of the Supreme Court. Uh, it, you know, because I think the, uh, it, there's a real risk that it, it becomes seen as just another partisan arm of government, um, as opposed to a truly independent body. Um, and uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, during the last term, uh, Chief Justice Roberts was, um, he's conservative, don't get me wrong, uh, uh, but he, uh, on several cases, um, uh, voted with the, the liberal bloc uh, for some 5-4 uh, decisions on DACA. He was uh, the author of the opinion. Uh, um, he voted um, uh, to, uh, uh, to um, reject a Louisiana abortion uh, bill, uh, even though he is uh, against abortion, uh, and I think is probably against Roe. Um, he uh, ruled in the way he did because the court just a couple of years ago had outlawed a virtually identical statute from Texas. And uh, uh, just out of coherence, he said, you know, we can't uh, one year say this is unconstitutional and the next year say it is. Um, but uh, I, I, I wonder about uh, the, the kind of risk that we are becoming the government, uh, a government controlled by the minority over the majority. Mm -hmm. uh, um, where uh, we have a president who lost the popular vote. We have a, a, a Senate who can confirm judges and justices um, uh, from, from, from states that collectively represent less than 50% of the population. Uh, and then we vested uh, all of this kind of final decision-making authority in, in the court. So it, it's, it's kind of minority, minority, uh, uh, minority. Uh, I, I don't know what your all's thoughts are about, about that. It's kind of the way the system was designed, I guess. It was. And, and, and when you put it all together like that, Janet, I mean, it is, it is very, um, concerning, but I, I, I will say a, a couple of things in, in, in response. So first, maybe this is a time where we have to rely a lot more on the state courts and on our, uh, on, on Congress, right? Because I, I think while the court, especially the Supreme Court has done so much important work um, at various times in history to protect the minority. Um, we we also see, I think, right now the the danger of vesting so much of our hope and our dreams on that one court. So state courts are a place where there can be a lot of action that that takes place. State legislators um, can do a lot too. But but I also want to mention two other things, which is. I, I hope sometimes as you look at Supreme Court history, as you look at the justices, I mean, there are, and you mentioned Chief Justice Roberts, there are justices who evolve on the bench, right? You know, when, when we think about Justice White or uh, Justice Blackman even and his views on the death penalty, right? There are people who evolve and I can only hope that that will happen. Um, but the second thing is to your point about legitimacy and legitimacy of this court at this time when our democracy is in question, um, because I think it is. To go forward with the nomination right now of a Supreme Court justice risks the Supreme Court's legitimacy. And there's been a lot of talk about what, what is happening. And my question, what I wonder is, if you're, no matter how you might feel, about the current nominee. If you were her, 
if I were her, if I were Justice Barrett, when people are already voting, I mean, that is what risks the legitimacy of the court. The fact that she wants to move forward with this in this rushed time frame, when there's no time to truly vet. And, and, and the comparison with, with Justice Ginsburg just doesn't work, right? It wasn't in an election period the way we are now. There wasn't the divisiveness the way, the way it is now. We need to truly vet this nominee and we cannot do it with the limited time that we have. And so if we move forward right now and somehow she makes it and she's on the Supreme Court, what legitimacy does that court have when we know that this entire process is political? So yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way. It's really good. Yeah, Leon? You know, the, the fact is that, uh, you know, going back to, to our founders, that in many ways, you know, regardless of what they built into the constitution and to our laws, uh, the thing that has made our country survive is that uh, there have been those leaders who have been willing to look to the interests of the country mm -hmm. as opposed to the interests of their party or their interest of uh, themselves. Uh, that, that people, you know, have had the stature and the statesmanship to be able to say, look, there are more important issues than power. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem today is that, uh, you know, almost everything is getting heavily politicized. I mean, we're talking about the court, but look at the attorney general, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, the attorney general has always been uh, someone who at least uh, represents the independence of uh, fairly enforcing the law in this country uh, and represents an independent voice. I mean, I, you know, a lot of the presidents I worked for were not particularly excited by who was attorney general because you know, they knew that they were independent and they knew that they would conduct the investigations that they had to conduct. Uh, this president has basically politicized that office and Barr is basically playing uh, a political game. I mean, he's just a, a branch of uh, the president's uh, political arm uh, in doing what he's doing. And they're trying to do the same thing with the court, they're trying to do the same thing with the court. Uh, and that's what the president's interested in. The, re the reason he's appointed Barrett, and he's, he hasn't pulled any, any punches on this. He's basically said, you know, I, if, we, if the Supreme Court's going to decide the election, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I've got people on there who will vote the right way, even though he, you know, whether he knows or doesn't know uh, how, how she's going to vote. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the politicizing of those areas that historically have always been independent and have operated on the basis of doing the right thing, as opposed to just doing the political thing. Uh, that, that is also a scary prospect of what's happening today when you put all these other pieces together. Uh, Janet, you're right. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I think the court, uh, you don't know. I mean, I, I, and, and we've seen that happen before. Uh, but, uh, you know, judges ultimately have to deal with the law and interpret the law. And you would hope that they would do that fairly. But in a highly politicized situation, and we saw that, frankly, with uh, Gore versus Bush, uh, that e even though, I mean, Sandra Day O'Connor, who I always had a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, even she decided to go along with that decision. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that we, we have to somehow resurrect this sense that people in these important jobs have to operate not on the basis of party, but on the basis of what's right for our country uh, and in line with our constitution. Uh, we've got to get back to that because yeah. if everything is political. If everything's nothing, you know, nothing but protecting the party or protecting your base or protecting whatever the hell, you know, you think is going to keep you in office. If that's what it's about, then no matter what happens in this election, uh, we're still doomed. 
Yeah. We've got to get back to the basic principle that you're there because you have to represent the interests of the country. Yeah. Not your own interest. Yeah. Yeah. I want to um, uh, just uh, alert you to uh, a change uh, that's uh, happening in the states uh, with respect to uh, the conduct of uh, the presidential election and the electoral college. Um, uh, there's something called the uh, uh, popular vote interstate compact, and uh, it's uh, an effort uh, uh, to have states agree that the electors that they will send to the college um, will uh, uh, vote for the candidate who won the national popular vote. Uh, and uh, that is a way to, to get us out of the need to amend the constitution about the electoral college and, and, and all the rest, but to uh, cement um, uh, within our presidential politics anyway, the notion that uh, uh, he or she who wins the national popular vote uh, should also win the, the uh, electoral college vote. I'm interested in your, your thoughts about uh, that possible reform. You want anybody to start here? Yeah, Leon. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you start, Leon. <laughs> I'm still thinking through what I think. <laughs> I, uh, look, I, I think that, you know, we all understand the history of the Electoral College, and it was very much uh, uh, one of those compromises that was made in order to make sure that they could get the votes to pass the Constitution. Uh, and uh, yet, you know, in, in our in our democracy, I think we recognize that the voice of the people should decide who becomes president of the United States. Uh, it shouldn't be the result of a political bargain uh, or a political deal uh, or an electoral college that decides to do its own thing. Uh, and we've seen too much of that in recent history. Uh, and we all, I think we all understand that uh, changing the Electoral College uh, and getting a constitutional amendment to get rid of it is very tough to do because of the numbers that you're dealing with. In this. Uh, those states want to protect uh, their power to have a voice uh, in the Electoral College. And so uh, it's not easy to be able to change uh, the Constitution. So I think we are left with uh, these, these states trying to uh, take action on their own to require that their electors abide by the popular vote. Uh, and if we can get more states to do that, uh, I think that would be very important uh, to try to make sure that we get back to a position where uh, the candidate who wins the popular vote in America <laughs> becomes president of the United States. Right. I I, I have to agree um, with that because if that, when that doesn't happen, as we saw with our, our last election, it also becomes so much more difficult to convince people to get out to vote, right? right. Because everyone says, why should I? It doesn't matter. Why am I wasting my time? And then today with COVID, I mean, it's, it, so, so I think it's so critically important for us to do that. And I, you know, people always call me an optimist. So I, I'll just add this other point, which which picks up on this interstate compact that you mentioned, Janet, um, but also everything that we've been talking about today, because, and I think Secretary, you said this at the beginning, we have taken it for granted that all of our norms and institutions would work because people would live up to them. We never imagined that we would have a president like this or people in Congress acting the way that they have. So in some ways, if we can actually make it through this, then things like the interstate compact and some of the reforms that we have to put in place is a good thing because we haven't realized that we needed to. Um, and I guess we're still a young country. So we, we, we have to do it, right? We have to put these rules in place to protect us from ourselves in situations just like this. Yeah, yeah. We're, we are uh, reaching uh, the, the last few minutes of our uh, discussion and uh, maybe uh, I'd like to uh, uh, 
uh, close by um, asking you um, to kind of s summarize um, where you, are you an optimist or a pessimist about the future of the country? Do you think we're going to uh, be able to uh, uh, satisfactorily make our way through this election period or do you think we're going to devolve into chaos? Um, do you think our institutions of government, um, our, our courts, our legislative branch uh, are going to be uh, strong enough to stand up to uh, uh, um, wh whatever is happening? Uh, and, um, you know, use your best crystal ball thinking. Um, uh, are you, uh, how worried are you? Leon, you want to start? Uh, sure. Uh, well, if staying awake at night <laughs> and worrying about what the hell is going to happen with our country is any indication, uh, you know, I think I think the answer to your questions is that there are moments when I'm very pessimistic about uh, what can happen, uh, largely because. I really never expected in my lifetime that I would see a president like the one we have. I just never, never imagined that uh, the American people uh, would elect uh, somebody like a Donald Trump and that Donald Trump would be president of the United States and then behave as he's behaved in that office which is, you know, having Janet, you and I have been in the Oval Office uh, and to be there and to feel like, you know, you're almost in a sacred place, the center of power for the country and for that matter, the world. Uh, and the awe I used to have, you know, just walking into the Oval Office uh, and uh, sensing, you know, that this is really the center of everything we believe in in terms of our constitution and who we are as a people. Um, so that, you know, that I get, I get very pessimistic uh, when I think that somebody like a Donald Trump who has no rules, has no boundaries, has no standards, is immoral, is a bully, is narcissistic, uh, has all of the wrong qualities. I don't, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people in politics. I've never met, you know, even the worst person I've met in politics always has at least one redeeming quality. <sighs> this guy has no redeeming qualities. I mean, yeah. just a little compassion, a little understanding of what people are going through, uh, a little, you know, sense of decency. Uh, I don't see it. And so, you know, when you have somebody like that in, in the most powerful position in the country, uh, I worry about that. But then there are also moments when I'm optimistic. And, and why? Because, you know, the greatness of this country doesn't lie in Washington. The greatness of this country lies in the American people. Uh, and we've been through a lot in this country. We really have. You know, we'll, Civil War basically almost split this country apart and we were able to somehow get through that. And the world wars and the recessions and the depressions and the natural disasters. But, you know, as Secretary of Defense, when I used to look into the eyes of our men and women in uniform, and these are, these are kids, you know, they're the ages of my, my sons at the time and realized that they were willing to put their lives on the line and fight and die for this country. That if there are people in this country who believe that deeply in the importance of our country and what our country is all about, love of country, uh, then, then I think that that spirit and resilience and common sense of the American people somehow is still going to prevail. 
You know, if you, you know, I've been all over the country in every community I've gone into, whether it's red state or a blue state, that, you know, the same basic values are there in these families. They care about their kids. They care about an education. They care about their faith. They care about their work. Uh, they care about their community. I mean, uh, de Tocqueville was right. The one ingredient that we have in a democracy is that we care about each other, that we care about our community. That's what makes our democracy what it is. And so, you know, that, that kind of trust in the good judgment of the American people uh, keeps me optimistic as well. So I, it just depends on what the hell the news is from moment to moment. <laughs> As to whether I best <laughs> tell you this, I've been saying a hell of a lot of Hail Marys lately. <laughs> Song, anything you, you'd like to like to I, add here? Just very quickly, I, I thought that was a beautiful answer. It almost exactly is um, what I feel. So I'll just add maybe one thing because I know we're 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 out of time. Um, but but I am an optimist in the end, even and that doesn't mean that we won't descend into chaos first, I guess. <laughs> All right. So I, um, because I do think that we as a country, at least some some portions of our country have gotten complacent about what we have and what democracy means. And sometimes you need someone like a Trump to remind us of the important values of our democracy and, and what we fought for and continue to fight for. It's not, we're, we're not perfect by any means, but we thought we were at a different place than we actually are. And to have someone like Trump and to have so many people follow him so easily tells us how much work we actually have and had to do before Trump was ever elected. So having Trump in place at least allows us to now make a choice of what type of country and what type of people we are. And I have to be an optimist about that. And if I'm wrong, then I guess we'll find out. But at least for now, I have to believe that most of us, the majority of us as American people care about the country that we fought to have despite all the work we have to do and that we're willing to continue to fight to live the values that we say we have. So in the end, I have to be an optimist and I guess we'll see. Well, we'll we will be tested and um, uh, through that testing, I think in the end, we will be stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what we all have to have to hope. Uh, uh, Leon Song, I have to thank you on behalf of the Goldman School uh, and of UC Berkeley. Uh, for those of you who uh, are, are watching or have uh, watched this panel, um, you should uh, look online for other Berkeley conversations. Uh, um, uh, there's a, there are several other um, interesting panels um, uh, in our future. Um, but I thought this one was just terrific. Uh, and we covered a lot of ground, uh, I, I must say. So uh, I want to uh, thank you uh, both for your participation and uh, your, your contributions. Um, and uh, we'll, we will all wait and see what happens next. Mm. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much. Um, it was cathartic to have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly the day after the debate, right? Exactly. <laughs> if we can call what that was a debate. <laughs>